Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Bryony e. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection is on chapter 234. Chapter 234. Scarcely had Pierre laid his head on the pillow before he felt himself falling asleep. But suddenly, almost with the distinctness of reality, he heard the boom, boom, boom of firing, the thud of projectiles, groans and cries, and smelled blood and powder, and a feeling of horror and dread of death seized him. Filled with fright, he opened his eyes and lifted his head from under his cloak. All was tranquil in the yard. Only someone's orderly passed through the gateway, splashing through the mud, and talked to the innkeeper. Above Pierre's head, some pigeons, disturbed by the movement he had made in sitting up, fluttered under the dark roof of the penthouse. The whole courtyard was permeated by a strong, peaceful smell of stable yards, delightful to Pierre at that moment. He could see the clear starry sky between the dark roofs of two penthouses. Thank God there's no more of that, he thought, covering up his head again. Oh, what a terrible thing is fear, and how shamefully I yielded to it. But they, they were ready and calm all the time, to the end, thought he. They, in Pierre's mind, were the soldiers, those who had been at the battery, those who had given him food, and those who had prayed before the icon. They, those strange men he had not previously known, stood out clearly and sharply from everyone else. To be a soldier, just a soldier, thought Pierre as he fell asleep. To enter communal life completely. To be imbued by what makes them what they are. But how cast off all the superfluous, devilish burdens of my outer man? There was a time when I could have done it. I could have run away from my father as I wanted to. Or I might have been sent to serve as a soldier after the duel with Dolokhov. And the memory of the dinner at the English club when he had challenged Dolokhov flashed through Pierre's mind, and then he remembered his benefactor, Torjak. And now a picture of a solemn meeting on the lodge presented itself to his mind. It was taking place at the English club, and someone near and dear to him sat at the end of the table. Yes, that is he. It is my benefactor, but he died, thought Pierre. Yes, he died, and I did not know he was alive. How sorry I am that he died. And how glad I am that he is alive again. On one side of the table sat Anatoly, Dolokhov, Nesvitsky, Denisov, and others like them. In his dream, the category to which these men belonged was as clearly defined in his mind as the category of those he termed they. And he heard these people, Anatoly and Dolokhov, shouting and singing loudly. Yet through their shouting, the voice of his benefactor was heard, speaking all the time and the sounds of his words was as weighty and uninterrupted as the booming of the battlefield, but pleasant and comforting. Pierre did not understand what his benefactor was saying, but he knew, the categories of thoughts was also quite distinct in his dream, that he was talking of goodness and the possibility of being what they were. And they, with their simple, kind, firm faces, surrounded his benefactor on all sides. But though they were kindly, they did not look at Pierre and did not know him. Wishing to speak and to attract their attention, he got up, but at that moment his legs grew cold and bare. He felt ashamed, and with one arm covered his legs from which his cloak had in fact slipped. For a moment, as he was rearranging his cloak, Pierre opened his eyes and saw the St. Penthouse roofs, post, and yard. But now they were all bluish, lit up, and glittering with frost or dew. It is dawn, thought Pierre. But that's not what I want. I want to hear and understand my benefactor's words. Again he covered himself up with his cloak, but now neither the lodge nor his benefactor was there. There were only thoughts clearly expressed in words, 
thoughts that someone was uttering or that he himself was formulating. Afterwards, when he recalled those thoughts, Pierre was convinced that someone outside himself had spoken them, though the impressions of that day had evoked them. He had never, it seemed to him, been able to think and express his thoughts like that when awake. To endure war is the most difficult subordination of man's freedom to the law of God, the voice had said. Simplicity is submission to the will of God. You cannot escape from him. And they are all simple. They do not talk but act. The spoken word is silver, but the unspoken is golden. Man can be master of nothing while he fears death. But he who does not fear it possesses all. If there were no suffering, man would not know his limitations, would not know himself. The hardest thing, Pierre went on thinking or hearing in his dream, is to be able in your soul to unite the meaning of all. To unite all? he asked himself. No, not to unite. Thoughts cannot be united, but to harness all those thoughts together is what we need. Yes, one must harness them, must harness them, he repeated to himself with inward rapture, feeling that these words and they alone expressed what he had wanted to say and solved the question that tormented him. Yes, one must harness. It is time to harness. Time to harness. Time to harness, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, some voice was repeating. We must harness. It's time to harness. It was the voice of the groom trying to wake him. The sun shone straight into Pierre's face. He glanced at the dirty inn yard in the middle of which soldiers were watering their lean horses at the pump while carts were passing out of the gate. Pierre turned away with repugnance and closing his eyes quickly fell back on the carriage seat. No, I don't want that. I, I don't want to see and understand that. I want to understand what was revealing itself to me in my dream. One second more and I should have understood it all. But what am I to do? Harness. But how can I harness everything? And Pierre felt with horror that the meaning of all he had seen and thought in the dream had been destroyed. The groom, the coachman, and the innkeeper told Pierre that an officer had come with news that the French were already near Mazak, and that our men were leaving it. Pierre got up, and having told them to harness and overtake him, went on foot through the town. The troops were moving on, leaving about 10,000 wounded behind them. There were wounded in the yards, at the windows of the houses, and the streets were crowded with them. In the streets, around carts that were to take some of the wounded away, shouts, curses, and blows could be heard. Pierre offered the use of his carriage, which had overtaken him, to a wounded general he knew, and drove with him to Moscow. On the way, Pierre was told of the death of his brother-in-law Anatoly and that of Prince Andrew. That ends my reading of chapter 234. I will now proceed to my reflection on the same. A Year of Warm Peace, Day 234 Silence not since John Bunyan's Christian has a man awoke and beheld such a spiritually significant dream as Pierre does today. We can only hope that, unlike Pierre's previous experience with spiritual awakening, he is able to consistently apply the lessons he has learned from the dream as he pilgrim progresses forward. Having returned from the Battle of Borodino and settled into sleep at the inn yard, Pierre tries to get some rest. He shook from his near slumber, however, by a series of booming cannon reports. Turns out it's just some post-traumatic stress disorder hallucinations. He looks outside and everything is fine. As he covers his head with some blankets to try to sleep, he thinks about the horror of the battle. He compares his fearful and agitated reaction to that of the soldiers who seem to endure the assault with a heroic and even stonily stoic patience. He falls asleep, wishing he was like those soldiers. In his dreamscape, he's attending a dinner at his beloved English club. On one side of the table sit his old Masonic benefactor, Joseph Alexievich Bazdiev, and some of the Stoic soldiers from Borodino. On the other side of the table are members of Pierre's aristocratic set, Dalaklav, Anatoly, Denisov. The aristocratic set is loud and boisterous. Bazdiev tries to communicate something to Pierre over their riot. The soldiers, naturally, are calm and collected. Eventually, Bazdiev is able to make himself understood over the commotion, this is what he has to say. Quote, to endure war is the most difficult subordination of man's freedom to the law of God. Simplicity is submission to the will of God. You cannot escape from him. They are simple. They do not talk, but act. The spoken word is silver, but the unspoken is golden. Man can be master of nothing while he fears death, but he who does not fear it possesses all. 
If there were no suffering, man would not know his limitations, would not know himself. End quote. Here, Bazdiev sets up Pierre's soldiers as the paradigm for how best to live in the world. The world, as Pierre has seen and Bazdiev confirms, is a place of great suffering, a relentless war of sound and fury. Yet nature, as we've discussed before, says nothing about this state of things. Bazdiev's recommendation, then, is to meet life just as it meets you, with silence. Silence is the opposite of how Pierre has traditionally approached things. From the very beginning, way back at Anna Pavlovna's initial soiree, Pierre has always been itching to speak, to comment, to express himself. This part of his character is represented in the dream by the loud aristocratic set. A new life, that of the silent, stoic soldier, awaits him on the other side of the table, should he decide to follow in their path. Perhaps this time his commitment to a new life will not be as fleeting as his dream was today. Daily Meditation Be mostly silent, or speak merely what is needful and in few words. We may, however, enter sparingly into discourse sometimes, when occasion calls for it, but let it not run on any of the common subjects as gladiators, the horse races, athletic champions, or food or drink, the vulgar topics of conversation, and especially not of men, so as neither to blame or praise or make comparisons. But if you are able, then, by your own conversation, bring over that of your company to proper subjects. But if you happen to find yourself among strangers, be silent. Epictetus in Chiridion. All right, and that concludes my reading of and reflection on chapter 234 of War and Peace. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for joining me. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook, A Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one time donation at PayPal. The links to all that are down below in the show notes. Tomorrow, we're going to be reading and reflecting on chapter 235. I hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and others.